Well, Mr. Strawn, tell us about who you are, introduce yourself uh, and your role here at Lindblom. Great. So my name is Brandon Strawn, and I'm the resident principal here at Lindblom. The, the residency is a program through the Chicago Leadership Collaborative that partners with a lot of post-secondary institutions, for instance, UIC and Dominican and National Lewis University next year and, and thereabouts. And then not only am I studying to get my principal certification through them, but then also I'm going through CPS eligibility right now and getting on the on the ground training with Alan Mather who's the principal here and so while I'm here I am a full-fledged member of the administration I'm on several teacher teams I work one-on-one -on -one with a lot of different teachers and operations here and one big part of CPS nowadays is called reach evaluations whereby administrators and others are evaluating teachers and so I, I am doing a lot of that as well and I really really love it. It's Lindblom is an amazing school and this has been a really amazing opportunity to um, work at what is the the top performing predominantly African-American high school in the state and to be working with Alan Mather who though he he'll be shy to admit it but he's the first ever Golden Apple principal winner last year and it, it I feel like I've won the golden ticket in terms of gotten, getting placed here at Lindblom. Great, wonderful. Uh, what types of projects are you working on here? Um, so the types of projects I work on here are intentionally varied so that I get a really holistic picture of what the principalship is like. And it, this involves external relationships with Code.org and with the Englewood Community Action Council, as well as attending as many local school council and other meetings as I possibly can. But a lot of internal things as well. I run a mentoring program here for new teachers. We had 15 new teachers this year, which is 20% of our teaching staff. So wanted to make sure that they had the support that they need to not only feel like a part of the community and feel like they they could get their training here, but then feel like they could be further developed here and want to stay here. And I've also been working with a lot of the teacher teams in terms of their professional development and hoping, and also working with the teachers so that we can all work on a, something called proficiency-based learning, which is ensuring that our test scores, which are great, are really well aligned to our grades. The, the question is, what do grades measure? And this has been a very deep and challenging question that we've all been tackling together. We're, we believe very strongly in distributed leadership here at Lindblom, so we've been making sure that we weave every single teacher into this conversation to make sure that we have a really solid assessment and grading system next year in place school-wide. Tell us a little more about the uh, Computer Science for All. Sure. Program. So Computer Science for All is a program through Chicago Public Schools that is really working to counterbalance the dearth of students who are experiencing computer science and other STEM initiatives, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math, other STEM initiatives throughout Chicago before they even get to college. And obviously this is a 21st century, very tech-rich environment that students are going to be entering, not only in college but thereafter. And so it's incredibly important that they get these experiences as young as possible. In particular for young female students and students of color, they don't always get a lot of the same resources that all other students are getting. And so it's crucially important that we target to make sure that everyone gets an equal opportunity to understand a lot of these resources and to know how to use them and to be competitive in the job market and the college market as well. And so the way that CS for All is set up is the district works then with cohorts of schools. Lindblom was in cohort one, which started this year. Next year, cohort two is starting. And they then provide us resources and support in order to holistically and comprehensively comprehensively involve CS initiatives at our school. At Lindblom, the way that this has manifested itself has been through our Code.org program, the robotics program, engineering classes at, at multiple different levels, a class called Fuse, which is sort of a combination of engineering and art for students who otherwise might not have expressed an interest in engineering, video gaming, and next year one piece that we're adding is web design as well. So we really try to paint a huge picture of all that tech can encompass for our students so that they can experience that and choose for themselves where their interests lie. Now, why did Lindblom apply to be part of that first cohort? As a math and science academy, Lindblom applied to be part of that first cohort because we, we really wanted to be on the front edge and really wanted Englewood to be on the front edge of technology and to make sure that our students got these amazing resources that they deserved to, to really push themselves and to get the opportunities that um, when one thinks of Englewood, one may not initially think of. But um, if you actually look around, it's really exciting 
exciting the number of opportunities that we and a lot of other schools have been providing for these students. And a lot of that is really thanks to the support we've gotten from CS for All. They've been really supportive throughout the year, and we're very happy to see that the program is growing and flourishing. Wonderful. Now, could you talk about the partnership with Henderson? It's very creative and innovative. Please. Sure. So we created a partnership with Henderson at the beginning of this year to address an issue that has been um, very strong with us for a while, and that is Lindblom is a selective enrollment school in Englewood, and we're very proud of it, but at the same time there's a perception that Lindblom is um, great and beautiful, but at the same time unattainable to local Englewood residents. And that is a, a perception that we have really wanted to combat. And we have decided to use computer science and a program called Code.org to combat that perception. So there's really been two different parts of the program. The first, which has been read by led, the first which has been led by Jesus Duran, who is our computer science teacher and CTE um, career and technical, and I don't know what the E stands for, and our CTE chair. Um, he has been leading the the computer science development of this partnership. And what that entails is on a weekly basis, fourth and fifth graders from Henderson, who are like the top of the bunch in Henderson, come to Lindblom and work in our computer labs and are then not taught how to use a computer but taught how to code and hearing fourth and fifth graders use words like iteration and logarithm and loop and debugging is just mind-blowing because when I was in fourth and fifth grade I was just learning how to type and so that's been really exciting but the way that we've done that is not by having Mr. Duran teach them but having our students teach them so all of our students um, from 9th through 12th grade are mentors and instructors to them it's not even tutors because tutor implies supplementing some other teaching this is instructing from scratch and so the students use a lot of game oriented activities involving things like Angry Birds and Frozen to uh, understand how a computer works and how you can use loops to um, get multiple things done with just a few lines of code and it's been really eye-opening for them just to see how pervasive computers and technology are in their environment and then this is also of course by the very nature of the program helping them with their math and their science experiences so by the end of this year, after they've taken the NWEA test, we will be testing that to see if it's had any impact on it as well. Um, and However, this is just part one of the program. Part two of the program, where I come in, is really reaching out to their parents and to the community in general. Not only do we want the students to come in here weekly, but we want to invite the parents as much as possible and to inform them as to what Lindblom is like, what we're about, and how one gets into it. So, at the beginning of the year, what I did was Sorry, I've been like let's, let's burping. Pause. Yeah. <laughs> this is excellent. This is excellent content. Let's pause. Mm -hmm. CTE is a computer and technical education? Yes. Okay. okay. You said logarithm and algorithm. You want to redo that one? Oh, I algorithm? did. It's an algorithm, okay, yeah. So mm -hmm. let's, let's redo CTE. Okay. Talk about, uh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and then talk about it's great to see the kids. Sure. The algorithm, iteration, etc. Great. Perfect. And then we'll give you a breather just to take Sure, yeah. Get Sometimes I can just yeah. keep going. No, it's perfect. Okay. It's perfect. I, I love this. Great. Um, I feel like. For a while, I was like, I shouldn't be on the news. <laughs> um, so, um, you ready? Yeah. Cool. So, um, CTE, you want to start there? Sure. Who, who teaches the uh, CS for All stuff here at Liberal? Sure. So, Jesus Duran, who is not only our computer science chair, but also in charge of the partnership with CTE, Career and Technical Education in Chicago, he is the one who's really spearheading the, the actual content part of this. So, he empowers our student instructors to work with these fourth and fifth graders who come weekly from Henderson. Then, um, the other one, oh, logarithm. It's really, it's really exciting to hear fourth and fifth graders using words like algorithm and iteration and loop and debugging, considering that when I was in fourth and fifth grade, I was barely learning how to type. So seeing how times have changed over the last 20 some years is really exciting knowing that we are genuinely preparing these students for the skills they will need to survive in the workplace. What do the Henderson students get out of this code.org partnership? And then what do the Limblum students get out of this code.org partnership? Absolutely. So both of them are just getting leaps and bounds, or both of them are getting so much out of this partnership. The Henderson students, first of all, are seeing firsthand what Lindblom is like, what the resources we have are, and learning how to get in, while at the same time forming a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a really high-achieving college-bound Lindblom student. And so we've made sure that our students really run the gamut in terms of their other interests, and so they, they really get to see 
a wide variety of students, and sometimes they, they vary from day to day in terms of specifically whom they work with, but it's exciting to see that those relationships flourish, and knowing, having spoken with a lot of the Henderson teachers, how excited their kids are to come here every week is very heartening to me. From our students, it's also really, really valuable because they are not only expanding their own knowledge by going through a lot of these concepts that they understood, but at the same time one doesn't truly understand something until one can convey it to someone else. But additionally, they're learning the joys of teaching. When I was introducing the program to them, I explained that when I was in the National Honor Society in high school and needed to do tutoring hours, that's when I learned that I wanted to be in education. And just the other day, Nathan, who is one of our tutors, said, "This is I've loved this program so much, I'm going to be a teacher now. I'm very excited about it. And so hearing that just really knows that we are inspiring the next generation of computer scientists and educators is just absolutely thrilling. That's amazing. Let's talk about some of the numbers. How many uh, students are exposed to CS for All program here at Limbaland? Sure. Can I also answer? I forgot the uh, the parent portion of it. The so my. My real emphasis in terms of the program is working with these fourth and fifth grader Henderson students' parents. And um, I assessed them at the beginning to see how well they understood the rather laborious process of applying to and getting into a selective enrollment in high school. And on this little assessment I gave them, the average mastery was a 15%, which demonstrates that they didn't understand, which makes perfect sense because it's very confusing. And so, one way that we have combat that is, first of all, I've attended several LSC meetings, which is local school council LSC meetings at Henderson and at Lindblom to publicize the program and just share the amazing work that we're doing. But at the same time, also reaching out to them personally. And the back in January, we had our first evening dinner in which we invited a whole bunch of the Henderson parents as well as Chicago and Englewood um, business people to come and join us and we had 50 different people here to not only celebrate all of the great things that had happened in the program but also inform them as to what the selective enrollment application process looks like what tests we look at what grades we look at etc and what how they do it and at the end I gave them a little exit slip to see how well they had understood it and they jumped from 15 percent to 86 percent understanding of it so a huge jump and they, uh, they, 100 percent of them got the question right that said, if you have any questions, do you know where to turn? And so that to me is just the number of doors that is opening for these students who otherwise might not have considered Henders, who might not otherwise have considered Lindblom an opportunity for them is, is mind blowing. And just the number of trajectories of these students and their families that we are impacting is is, is really what motivates us to keep Excellent. going. Let's do that in a, in a sentence. So okay. Let's do the 15% to 85% and 100%. Let's do that. Sure. Because we got the great content and then we'll do a, sure. a good sound bite. Sure. In, after having worked with the parents of the students who are coming here, they jumped in mastery rate of understanding the selective enrollment application process from 15% to 86%, demonstrating that they, they really grew leaps and bounds in terms of understanding what that process entails. And on the one question of, if you have any questions, do you know where to go? 100% of them got that right, which really um, assuages any fears that they would feel alone in the process because it's difficult. Why do you teach? Why are you an educator? I am an educator. Oh, that's a, a big question. The When I was growing up, I was a big nerd myself and I had so many opportunities and my parents took me to a lot of concerts and plays and everything and I thought this is great and I loved school and I thought that the life that I was receiving was normal. The education was adequate and everything was great. I then moved to Chicago and I turned my nerddom into wanting to teach it and became a high school math teacher. And I found that the education that I had received was not adequate, it was exemplary. And that because of my race, because of my gender, because of my zip code, I had been afforded opportunities that not everyone is afforded. And I really wanted to be a huge part in making sure that this achievement gap and this opportunity gap was destroyed. I, I wanted to make sure that everyone had these same opportunities, particularly in the STEM fields that I really love and the arts fields that I really love.
And so after teaching math for a while, I really loved it, but I wanted to increase my impact even further. So now I'm really happy to be in the CLC, the Chicago Leadership Collaborative, and a resident principal to not only empower students to be the best that they can be, but to empower teachers to continually grow and support our students to make sure that everyone has the ability to receive an amazing education regardless of their zip code. We want to give you a chance to shout out your, um, your um, partners. So sure. Yeah. Sure. So this program would not have happened at all without the support of True Schools, which is a program that we worked with over the summer. We we applied to and then got into that, and we went to their summer design program and worked with them over five weeks over the summer to really craft this program. And then they, um, after the work that we have done, they. Uh, awarded us with a grant which has provided us not only with equipment to use in the classrooms but also transportation so that we can take these fourth, fifth graders as well as high schoolers to see CS in the field which is coming up later this month and I'm very excited for it. And so True Schools and the Chicago Education Fund which funded the program has been invaluable to its success. Additionally, like I said, the CS for All program as well as the CTE department in Chicago Public Schools have really opened a lot of doors for us in terms of making connections with the community and the city that otherwise we have, would be siloed and we wanted to make sure that not only are we getting great work done but we're able to spread it so that other people can experience it. And uh, finally, just working in Englewood itself within the, the network partners and Network 11 and Liz Kirby have been very open and excited about the work that we've been doing. And working with the Englewood Community Action Council has been very exciting to see the number of doors we can open there. One, one piece I really want to add is that this program that is happening here at Lynn Bloom, the actual um, the tutoring of the students and having them come in weekly. This is something that while we're very proud of it, it is by far not unique to Lynn Bloom. This is a program that can be scaled up and replicated incredibly easily and effectively um, and we're happy to do so and share all of our resources and ideas that have worked and ideas that have not and should be avoided and because it's, it's so important nowadays that high schools in particular be able to demonstrate to feeder elementary schools the great resources and the great students that they have. So we feel that it is through computer science programs like code.org or other sort of mentoring and tutoring programs that uh, the elementary school students can see what high school life is like and then really get the thirst for that high school to, to bubble up in them and want to, want to go there. This is great. You like answer the question I was about to ask, but this is amazing. Uh, you look straight in the camera just this once mm -hmm. and say who you are and then say, like, I'm Brandon Strong, resident principal of Lynn Bloom um, Math and Science Academy, and I connect Chicago. Okay. okay. I'm Brandon Strong, resident principal at Lynn Bloom Math and Science Academy, and I connect Chicago. You know, target yourself for a mold where you're already inside of a hierarchy and not at the top, right? So for us, I think it's really important to kind of instill that because at such a young age, um, kids are still very, you know, they have that curious mind. Um, and we feel that kind of around when you start thinking about high school and the competitiveness to get to a high school is that when that mindset, start, that mindset starts to change and almost calcify, right, into where am I going to fit in instead of having agency myself. So these are a lot of the things that I think we go into in the back of our minds trying to negate um, so that kids really have a little bit more agency and they are aware, are aware of the opportunities available to them at that young age. Does it require a lot of hard work? And yes, it does, right? And we don't, we don't say that it's going to be easy. I mean, uh, a, lot, a, a media theorist once said that the most difficult and uh, unnatural thing is to learn to program a computer, right? So we start off with that. That's the reality, right? But is it accessible? Yes. Can you do it? Yes. I mean, I myself am a product of uh, Chicago Public Schools. I went to Morgan Park High School. Uh, I was the first person to go to high school from my family, first one to go to college, um, you know, first one to get a job as an engineer. Uh, I was a software engineer for 10 years in the field. And sitting in what we call the cagicals uh, for 12, 13, 15 hours a day was just not attractive to me. Uh, once you got a chance to reflect a little bit, right? I think that a lot of the times things are designed to not let you reflect um, and to just keep going, keep going, keep going. And that's what leaves the structures in place and us kind of enabling them. So upon reflection, I went back to school, 
for something that I deemed creative. It was the only way I can get a school or uh, my employer to pay at the time was to become a product designer because I could align it with our, with our field. Um, but underhandedly, I was getting an art education on, you know, revolving around things of issues of crea uh, criticality, social, social justice. There's a lot of movements with socially engaged art. Um, and to me, this is really what this is, is activism through education especially digital literacy and, uh, and, and, and not just educating one or two people, but really kind of enabling them to act as almost disciples in a sense, right? So that they can also help me uh, and help us. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, doing this type of work uh, to give hope to their siblings and their peers, right? Because we find that that's probably the most effective way. It's not just the couple of hours that we might have them sitting in front of us as educators, but really to think about it and to let it grow organically outward into their community. Because I think that's also, the community right now is not built to engage in those type of things. So uh, I think that, I mean, even where I grew up, we never talked about technology. We talked about uh, menial labor jobs, right? Um, and, and that frame, as a little kid, that becomes your frame of reference. And that becomes the, the plural, plural, plurality of all the opportunities that you might have. I mean, those become the targets for you to aim at. Um, and, it, and, and it wasn't until I was taken out of my own neighborhood. I grew up on the southeast side of Chicago. Um, you know, my father was a steel mill worker who had never gotten past sixth grade. Um, and once I got taken out of that community, then I got to see some of the op other opportunities and possibilities. And nobody ever told me that they weren't possible. And because we tended, we, we tended to move, and I was a little bit more isolated than most people, I think that I romanticize that in terms of, uh, yes, it is a possibility because I wasn't around enough people who didn't think it wasn't an op a possibility. And that's what we try to do with, uh, with, with our, our kids and our curriculums is really engage in that inquisitive, I mean, it's based around inquiry, right? Having them be curious, giving them situations where they can't help but be curious about something and make it accessible, but also in, you know, in uh, designing uh, pieces where it's gonna be a little bit difficult. So they get used to that. Right, because persistence uh, is is something that, like merit, you know, like training for a marathon. You do, you can't expect somebody to be persistent over long stretches of time. You have to challenge them little by little, and then the challenges can grow more, and you can ha ask more of them. Um, so our curriculum really is designed to really to do that. Uh, and the code.org curriculum, which we use for our introduction classes, is really geared towards that. I mean, they 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 teach of of the the three pillars, the three strands, which is inquiry, equity, and content. Right? So the content, of course, is our computer science content. Um, but even I went through computer science education and it was very dry and very uninteresting. Um, so kind of embedding the content into tasks and assignments that are more uh, equity and inquiry based is a lot more engaging for students as well. Um, so they're, they're constantly active and they're asking questions. And the more you commit to it as a teacher, the better it gets because they're asking the right questions. Because a lot of the times what happens is they'll, they'll ask me, well, what if I wanted to do this? And it's, that's what we're doing next, right? So they segue right into the next lessons because of that curiosity that they already have. Um, you know, and it's based around framing the, the lessons in, in, in such a way that that's where it, it invariably leads. Mr. Duran, you're a former software engineer, you're a software engineer. What about teachers who aren't software engineers? What can they do this too? Like, what, what skills do you need to do this? Or Yes, so f my feeling has been that if you're committed to teaching and to growing yourself, then I think it's accessible to anybody. The code.org curriculum itself um, has basically the whole year mapped out for you, but it ha has plenty of flexibility um, to allow you to customize it, to, to um, change it up a little bit based on context, right? Not every student learns at the same rate. Sometimes I find myself having to come up with other lessons to augment some of the ones that our kids might be having a particular trouble with. Um, so I think that as long as you're committed to it and, and try to really understand it and allow yourself to grow as, as, a, as a teacher, then I think it's really, it makes it really accessible. You know? um, so, and I've seen that because the best PD that I've been in was at the code.org PD, right? And there, that's how we, when, that's how we actually teach our kids for uh, teaching the curriculum to the elementary school kids. is our first month, we meet with just our high school kids and they run through mock lessons, 
right? The curriculum is laid out, so they really just have to worry about the de delivering it, right? And then we talk about why it works or how to make it better, and they, they're allowed to reflect on it as well. But they actually, we model uh, the, their class the first month very much like the PD that teachers go through to, to learn the uh, Exploring Computer Science curriculum from Code.org. Um, we, I show them a lesson, so first I do, and then I ask them to do with me, and then they uh, kind of give a lesson all by themselves to the rest of the class, and then we reflect on it. What could have, done, what could have gone better? What worked? What didn't work? And, you know, and, and then for me, I also introduced the challenge of sometimes I pretend to be the rowdy kid, right? Because it does, it does frame, their frame of reference is very different than ours. Um, typically, we're older, so we have a lot more life experience than they might have. Um, so we talk about what are those strategies going to uh, be. And I mean, something as simple as never touching the keyboard for a student, right? That's very, something very subtle, but something that I was taught uh, early in my teaching career at the university level um, is let, you know, talk them through it because at least they're going through the um, physical motions of actually doing the thing. So they're, they're actually processing as opposed to just leaning back, turning off, and having you do it for them. So something, and then they think about it. Right? And they notice, like, you do this in our class, and it's, it, now it also in, engages our students with their learning process. And I think that's very important because they, they start to learn on how to self-assess. And as you start moving through life, that's a very important skill to be able to assess where you are and to come up with a plan to, if you're not where you need to be, to get there and not be scared of that. Uh, I think that's another big thing is kids tend to, I don't know what this is, they shut off. Right, so a lot of the times we're sitting and if somebody says, hey, I don't know what that word is, I'm like, there's a computer right in front of you, Google it. Like there's, you know, if anything, kids need to understand to be Google ninjas by, you know, at some point, that's a very important life skill. Um, so they, they become very comfortable with this and you'll actually start asking less and less of the teacher. Um, and I mean, they'll bring it in, but now it becomes more of a discussion. And I think that's probably the most fruitful way to start learning. Um, and they also begin to have discussions amongst themselves, and sometimes you have to come in to weigh in a little bit. Can we talk about the relationship with uh, CS for All, that program, and how it speaks to the gap in uh, the Common Core? Can yes. Talk about that, revisit that. Yeah, so my understanding is that Common Core does not have computer science as, uh, as a component. So I've heard from numerous teachers around the country that some of the computer science programs are being cut from school curriculums because their school is focused on targeting Common Core only. Um, so that leaves out a, a, a large number of the population from even having access to computer science classes. So for us, cs for all was really became a really important vehicle to give us that opportunity to start to try to experiment. And we've been given enough flexibility here at Lindblom um, to run pilot programs like the program here that we have with, uh, with Henderson Elementary School, which is a neighborhood school, to bring the kids into, in here and also start developing relationships with, between our students and the elementary school students, um, and to also just make, give them access to some of the curriculum in a structured environment. Um, so for us, it's, the CS for All initiative has really been important for us to give us that opportunity and that support. Without that support structure, I think it becomes a very difficult uh, thing to sell across the board. Um, so I think CS for All is, and, and, and it's growing. So I know we were part of the first cohort and they're bringing in another cohort. And we've been asked also to uh, serve as ambassadors to the new cohort, which to me is very exciting because it, it puts me in contact with other people that are also going to be experiencing some of the experiences that we have and to share my experiences with them, right? Um, and then also, I guess it, it provides also, an, an, uh, an, it helps our network grow so that we can get more feedback and incorporate new ideas and th the things we're experimenting with here. What tools do you use outside of the code.org website uh, to engage the students? What tools? Uh... So it, it's, it's interesting for us, uh, we use primarily the code.org curriculum. They have uh, three different levels of curriculum for elementary school students. Um, and we use the course two, and then next year we'll be using the course three for students that are partaking in this year. Uh, the other thing that we tend to do is, in some of our coursework here, we produce pro uh, products, uh, namely video games. So we'll actually use those sometimes in sessions and have the kids play or test these video games. Right? So they see something that was created by some of the students here at Lindblom, um, and they get to break them, which is something I think a lot of kids like to do. And they get to write up a quick little report on something that they found that was broken in a video game. So that also kind of incorporates them in, in, in 
trying to subvert technology in a way and keep that inquiry kind of uh, perspective uh, fed, right? As opposed to trying to shut that down. I just want to clarify, is it the limbo the students create the video games and the Henderson students get to yes. play or test? Can we restate that? Uh, sure. So the, the people who have never been to limbo know, okay, limbo students create the video games, Henderson students get sure. kids have so. So, so one of the ways that we, uh, uh, one of the other tools that we use here at Lindblom with the Henderson uh, Elementary School students is in our video gaming, video gaming classes here at Lindblom, um, our students create video games. So we allow the Henderson Elementary School students to actually play or test the video games. Um, they'll look for bugs, they'll look for glitches, they'll try to break them, and they'll kind of write up a quick little report to feed it back to the uh, to the Limbloom students so that they can repair or fix or debug the issues that, that arise from uh, player testing their video games. Uh, so our students even benefit um, indirectly from this relationship that we have. And the Henderson students also learn a very useful skill in trying to uh, debug or trying to break uh, products that are made accessible because they're created by other students. This is this is excellent. I think we, we have the content we need. Are there any last thoughts? I think I've covered. I mean, you've covered everything. Uh, how do you select the students for here at Limbloom to teach the Henderson students, right? And just make sure you're looking at me. Sure. So some of the requirements that we do have with we make it known to the students, our Limbloom students, um, what this will entail, right? So you will be dealing with fourth and fifth graders. Uh, we make it a requirement that they have taken at least the introduction computer science course so that they have some uh, technical background uh, for the material. And then, um, and we, we, we talk to them, right? So the first month that we meet, it's just our students. So we kind of go through the motions and some of them uh, decide like, hey, this isn't for me. And that's okay, right? It's, it, it's, it's a very different uh, learning environment for our kids and uh, and sometimes they're not, they feel that it is going to be too daunting for them. So uh, some of the kids that we do bring in as well um, deal with more of the planning side. So if they don't want to deal directly with the kids, there's so much other things that go around to planning events, um, processing some of the data that we get in terms of the assessments that we give some of the kids um, that I think next year we'll also be offering a little bit more uh, leeway in terms of how to to support and contribute to the program, not just with the kids directly one-on-one, -on -one, but also in kind of uh, support roles as well. You talked about um, being a software engineer. Uh, what classes do you teach here at Moonbloom outside the CS for All? Just as you're like, before CS for All, what classes are you teaching here? So here at Limbloom, we teach uh, the introduction to exploring computer science. We also teach uh, video gaming one, video gaming two. We have an AP computer science. Next year, we'll be adding a, a web design curriculum. Um, we also have, um, in our colloquium classes, we have, of course, the uh, program with uh, the Henderson students. Next year, we're also introducing uh, robotics, animatronics. Um, and in the future, I mean, we're looking at other opportunities to creatively engage technology and to make it a little bit more accessible uh, in terms of uh, we're working with uh, the fine arts department and creating a new media course that incorporates really art and technology. So um, we're really excited about those strides. We're also engaging with the music department to create music for some of the video games our students are using to try to create a little bit more of an organic kind of feel for reusing a lot of the products that are created in a number of classes. A creative writing class next year, um, we're gonna ask them to save those narratives that they write and they're gonna become basis for video games the following year. Um, so we're really looking, I mean, I think, oops, <laughs> that's our motion sensor. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. This is amazing. Um, this, is, this is amazing. Uh, so for us, I think it's really important to, to, to try to, re to use, to leverage like our video gaming class and our, also our web class um, forthcoming to leverage any of the products that are created in other classes. Because I think there's nothing more fulfilling for kids than to create something and to see it reused somewhere else in a different context, right? I think there's a sense of pride that we've seen of some of the kids that in some of our other classes, they make beats, right? So we've asked some of them, can you create some audio and music for our video games? And when they see it in the video game, they get really excited, right? And it's something that's accessible from a number of students and parents. What are you most proud of? And if you want to share a story, uh, just a moment from this whole CS for All uh, process and this program, this pilot that you've run? I th I, sure. I think uh, 
one of the most fulfilling things for me at this point, um, there's been, in my teaching career, so I started teaching at the university level as soon as I was a grad student. Um, and there's been two moments where I think I've been the most fulfilled in, in terms of my profession. The first one was a student of mine actually started a company and contracted me um, as a software consultant. And as, as after our initial meeting at, um, I think I was at the Sears Tower, the Willis Tower, um, he said, without your class, I would have never thought that I could do this or that this was an option. And that just sent chills down my spine, you know, up, down my spine because I, I was, it, was, it was so genuine. And, I was, and that, those are the moments I think that as, as an educator that you dream, dream for. Um, and the same thing has happened here in our CS for All. One of the students that's involved in our uh, Henderson program said, Mr. Duran, I, I, I just found out that I really just want to be a teacher now. Um, and I had the same type of reaction, right? Because it was so genuine. And, and I think that's one of those things where you think about making an impact. Um, and it's very difficult, in, especially in CPS, to try to, to have an impact and to have somebody validate that impact for you, I think is very moving for me. And that's what keeps me going, I think. One last question. Sure. I know at times we tend to focus only on technology. The story you're telling says it's the, this work extends beyond just technology. Can we talk about that? How this is just it's bigger than technology? It seems. Yes. I mean, for me, I think it's really about growth and and opportunity. Um, I, from my art background, right? There's a lot of critical texts that we read about control, power structures, knowledge-based economies, um, digital economies, the network world. Um, and access and how all of those things kind of coalesce into control structures in society. Um, so for, for, I think for us, technology is a vehicle. Um, and where it takes you is really, I guess the point is, is wh where, where does it take you? Do you have agency of that or is it the Google automated self-driving car? right that's programmed by somebody else so for us i think it's really about having that knowledge and, and using that knowledge to make informed decisions right i think a lot of our students now are really looking at what they use and what they do under a very different lens um, and i think that for us that's really the the success uh and in, in some of the efforts that we're and the initiatives that we're really undertaking here is is is, is that broader open view instead of just the narrow focus view that they might have on technology. Sometimes they don't even see the technology, right? It's a screen, um, it's a curated experience. Um, and now that they can see outside of that, they can see all of the strings attached to that. I think that it, that's a very su uh, successful part of what we're doing here um, with, the kind of the, with the support from you know, CS for All initiatives um, because technology is here and I think it's not going anywhere. Very good. Very good. Amazing. Right. We need to do that to be the last to fix the camera and say who he is. Oh, yes. So, uh, oh, um, actually, can you look at me and introduce yourself as a computer science teacher or whatever that is uh, at Limbo? Sure. And then I'm going to have you turn to face the camera. And this initiative is called Connect Chicago. It's like technology, but it's also connecting, like you're connected to kids through Limbo and all that stuff. You just say, I'm going to switch around, uh, and I connect Chicago. So, if you can introduce yourself and what you do here at Limbo to me, sure. and then we'll pause and you'll turn to the camera. I okay. Uh, my name is Jesus Duran, and I am computer science teacher here at Lindblom Math and Science Academy. And if you could look at the camera and say your name and what you do and I connect Chicago. My name is Jesus Duran. I am a computer science teacher and a new media artist, and I connect Chicago. My name is Jesus Duran. Are we good? My name is Jesus Duran. I am a computer science teacher and a new media artist, and I connect Chicago. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, no worries. Uh, if you can. I am Alan Mather, the principal of Lynn Bloom Math and Science Academy. I've been principal here since 2005. The school was closed for two years, and I was able to relaunch it in 2005. The, uh, what is your instructional vision for Lynn Bloom? Can you maybe go through the environment that you? I think the big picture of what's happening here is that we want to provide unique opportunities to students. We want to build a place that is full of um, where students feel respect, where they are challenged and also supported. 
So there's a fair amount of freedom here for students, but there's a great deal of responsibility as well. It's responsibility not only to themselves and to their education, but this understanding that we have a responsibility to the greater Inglewood community. So what happens in the classroom is not just in the classroom, but is applied outside of the walls of the school as well. The, um, I know there's a number of, I, I'm just focused on CS for All. Mm -hmm. Sonia Harper reminds me all the time that there's yes. so much more going on in the world. Talk to us about some of the innovative programs here, like the Arabic program, and Chinese program, all that. So one of the students told us one of the largest Chinese programs in the city, if not the largest. So if you could talk to us about a few of these programs here. At sure, sure. So we have some unique programs here. We have a relationship with Baxter International. They fund the Biotechnology Center of Excellence. So we have the largest biotechnology program in the city, the first biotechnology program in the city, and a teacher training center in biotech. We also have the largest Mandarin language program within the Chicago Public Schools and the largest non-heritage Arabic program in the United States. Every year we send students to China, uh, Doha, Qatar, and Jordan. So um, there are kind of the gold standard for how schools are ranked is the U.S. News and World Report ranking. There's a gold medal is the highest level. Gold medal is the highest level in U.S. News and World Reports. Lynn Bloom is one of 17 gold medal schools in the state. There's um, only 500 schools across the United States are in gold medal status, and Lynn Bloom is one of those. Um, this year there are only two schools that are predominantly African-American and have over 60% free or reduced lunch. We're one of those two schools in the state that has reached that standard. You could talk to us a little bit about the CS for All program. Sure. Uh, why you pursued that as a religious school and what does that mean for the future of Lindbloom? We've decided to pursue CS for All for a couple of reasons. We have one day a week where we have non-traditional classes offered. We call it a colloquium. Um, those classes are often dedicated to service to the Inglewood community. Every year we bring leaders from the community in to have breakfast to share what they call problem statements and then we build classes around those problem statements. Our faculty meet with the leaders and we see where we can create courses. This digital divide came up over and over again and code.org through uh, the Breakthrough Schools had this opportunity to say you know we want your students really doing something interesting with coding and we thought well that's great for us but we want to be able to provide this to students within Inglewood who may not have the program at all so we reached out at a network meeting and just said to elementary school principals we're looking for principals who want to connect with us in this way so we can teach students coding and Henderson jumped at the chance they said we'd like to be the ones they were the first ones to speak up and so we knew that this is a way that we would not only help our students understand coding to be able to teach it, but also to engage students at a younger age and we hope make them want to come to a place like Lynn Bloom. Why is it important for students at Fred Henderson want to come here to Lynn Bloom? Why does that matter for Lynn Bloom? So for many years, Lynn Bloom was kind of a pariah in the community. Um, it was seen as an island separate from the community. It started out uh, with racial tensions in the 60s and it became a class issue, but those in Lynn Bloom wanted nothing to do with the community and the community wanted nothing to do with Lynn Bloom. And because of that tension, numbers declined, declined, and declined until the point where the board decided to close it. We know that to be successful, we have to be part of the Inglewood community. We need to be connected to the Inglewood community. We need to make certain that the Inglewood community sees us as a resource and not as the other. And so it's important for us to go throughout Inglewood and to make those connections that people articulate to us they need and also provide our students an opportunity to learn and to serve. If you could talk a little bit, I know there's a proud tradition of alumni in Inglewood. Uh, one of them is Mary Lily Walker. Mm -hmm. If you could talk to us about the history of Inglewood. Sure. Um, and, and from as far back as 1992 to the present, just a, give us a flavor of it. So Lynn Bloom opened in 1919. Um, it was a brand new school at the time where, obviously, so. Lynn, Bloom opened, Lynn Bloom opened in 1919. Um, it was one of two big technical high schools in the city. There were two great technical schools, Lane Tech on the north side, Lynn Bloom Tech on the south side. Uh, Roosevelt Road was the dividing line. If you live south of Roosevelt Road, you could apply to come to Lynn Bloom and get a great 
technical education. We had wood shop, we had plastic shops, a working foundry, sheet metal, all kinds of trades of the time, and trades that would take students directly to jobs. Well, of course, those jobs don't exist anymore, and so there had to be a revamping of what happens here. So now we offer computer science, gaming, and web design, as well as engineering, making certain that we're preparing students for what's coming, not for what was. And that's what education should do. It should prepare students for things they don't even know exist yet. And we're trying to prepare them for that. Just do that same thing. Yep. Uh, again, just out of high school, just, just do that same thing. Okay. Lynn Bloom opened in 1919. I mean, it was a technical high school. In fact, there were two great technical high schools in Chicago. Lane Tech on the north side, Lynn Bloom Tech on the south side. Roosevelt Road was the dividing line. If you lived south of Roosevelt, you could apply to Lynn Bloom. There was a time when there were thousands of students enrolled here um, as a technical school. Students could take wood shop, they could take ceramics, they could take um, sheet metal. There was a working foundry here, auto shop. In fact, I have a 1925 photo album that shows the girls' auto shop class. That's how progressive Lynn Bloom was. And it was preparing students for jobs at that time. Of course, so many of those jobs don't exist anymore. So when Lynn Bloom closed and reopened, we had to prepare them for what was coming and not what was. So we have two programs here, pre-engineering and computer science, both gaming and web design, to prepare students for what the world will be, because that's part of what education is. It's preparing people not for what is now, but what they don't even know is out there yet. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other thoughts that you want to leave with us? Uh, I mean, I know we could go in more in the history of like the racial tensions that existed here, but I don't know if you want all that. And Let's it, do it. Okay. Let's do that. Let's capture that. <clears throat> so there was a four-year period in the 60s where the freshman class went from 80% white to 80% black, um, a time of great racial turmoil. Um, the neighborhood was predominantly white, and many of the first black students who came here in Moss remember being harassed by the white residents as they came into the school. And this started the tensions. Um, Later, the school reflected the community racially, but this was the bougie school, and it was separate from the community. You could live across the street and not come to Lynn Bloom, and those in Lynn Bloom really wanted nothing to do with the community, and the community saw Lynn Bloom people as those who came and left and provided nothing. Is that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. You want to do one more thing? Yep. This is called the Connect Chicago Challenge. It's yep. About yep. Connecting yep. folks to skills and access, but also to each other. So we want you to look into the camera, introduce who you are, you know, uh, and, and say, you know, I'm a Alan Adler, principal of Lynn Bloom International Science Academy, and I connect Chicago. Okay. Right. So go straight to the camera. I'm Alan Mather, principal of Lynn Bloom Math and Science Academy, and I connect Chicago. One more time, Mr. Mather. Okay. I'm Alan Mather, the principal of Lynn Bloom Math and Science Academy, and I connect Chicago. Excellent. Thank you so All right. much. All right. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Kids here, and then we'll go to your school to Henderson. We'll pick all of you guys up, along with the other fourth graders that are also in the program, and then we'll head on up to Northwestern University. Any questions? You gotta get on the bus for grade. No, they're gonna be separate. Yes. yes. Thank you. And I'll be here with you guys next week, right? And next week I'll also be on. So, are we ready to get started? Yes. 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 So if your mentor's here, what do you do? Go to school. 
And if they're not? So this table can go? Freeze! This table can go. You guys can go too. She said she's so short. Go for it. Oh, he already got one, look. What did the video talk about, you guys? How did you get in the and then the blocks? How they all could do different things. It was talking about the um, black things that they do. This is a very boy. Have fun. Maybe. That light is really annoying. Really, uh, this is review. We've done this before.
playing with me today.